for joining us for the September edition of Coffee with Coker. As always, it's a privilege to have you join us. Immediately following today's presentation, we will have a question and answer period, so please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation in the area provided in the GoToMeeting dashboard. The participant phone line will be muted for today's presentation and the materials will be emailed to you tomorrow. As you exit the webinar, a brief survey will pop up and we would greatly appreciate your feedback on this presentation as well as suggestions for future topics. Mike Reibel, Senior Vice President at Coker Group, will be leading our presentation today. Please join me in welcoming Mark. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for, for everyone joining today. Um, I am excited to talk about this topic as uh, Savannah, Savannah introduced us and uh, jump right in. Uh, again, my name is uh, Mark Reibolt and I'm a, a, uh, one of the leaders of our transaction services group here at Coker and um, we do uh, a variety of, of, uh, of things as it relates to um, hospitals, health systems, uh, medical practices, physician groups, and, and other kind of allied health, anything in between, um, as it relates to transactions. Um, and so that ties into what we're talking about today and why you've joined. I imagine there's uh, a lot of uh, questions and a lot of uh, discussion going on out there in the marketplace right now about uh, transactions, whether it's a hospital M&A scenario or um, kind of traditional M&A or uh, something else, and we'll talk more about what that something else sometimes looks like or it, what it looks like today. And so um, I do encourage you guys to ask any questions, and I'll try to save some time at the end. Um, and and just uh, so you guys know, also, um, I, I'm, because of the time constraints we have for today and a lot of information here, uh, you may see me or, or feel like I'm breezing through some of the information a little quick, and, and uh, I do realize that. And so for any of you all that has questions about anything that I'm talking about today or something maybe I, I didn't talk about and left out um, that you're, you're wondering about or something um, in here or, or related to the information here that, um, that you'd just like to, to dive a little deeper and, and ask some follow-up questions or, or uh, you know, additional data points or anything like that, happy to, to uh, regroup and do that or, or send that on to you guys. So please don't hesitate to ask if there's um, kind of additional content you're looking for. Uh, a little bit about me here. I won't spend time on this, but again, I lead our transaction services group, and that just ties into uh, what we're talking about today. Um, and and we, by the way, this is, relates to transactions for all kinds of, of healthcare services entities, any sort of healthcare provider organization that, that kind of anything that falls under that continuum, if you will. Um, so what, what we're going to talk about today, I think um, one of the things that, um, you know, we have to look at when we're, when we're talking about transactions and, and what's going on today, looking at some of the trends, but particularly some of the, some of the things that have in the past that have led us up to where we are today and what we're seeing today and how um, some of the historical kind of lead up uh, uh, impacts that and um, and also looking at maybe how some of the trends today are driving some of the some of the things that we can expect tomorrow if you will so um, we're going to look at some trends um, we're going to talk a lot about value as you saw in the in the title of the uh, presentation we're talking about um, achieving long term value um, and and you know, exploring a, a transaction, whether regardless of size or scale or structure or what's entailed in that, any sort of deals you may be thinking about or deals you're doing that um, you know ultimately has to be part of a greater uh, uh, strategy or, or picture or perspective on you know value creation uh, and whatever that means for your organization. Uh, and and that is different for for each individual individual organization. Um, we'll also talk about a little bit more kind of specifics. Hopefully, we'll have time to dive into some specifics and the mechanics around you know successful transactions, what to look for, some you know process mechanics that we can look at that that you can have on your radar if you're thinking about or your organization is exploring a deal, um, or maybe you know you, you you're you're developing a strategy that you know. Um, a transaction is going to be involved, and so um, I want to go ahead and get ahead of the curve thinking about some of these things. Hopefully, we'll, we'll uh, get, get your thoughts flowing on, on that. So we'll dive right in. Um, when we talk about deals, doing deals, transactions, 
uh, regardless of whether you're talking about traditional M&A or some other kind of hybrid, whether it's joint venture or hospital physician alignment, um, anything within that continuum, really is not new to, to the healthcare industry. Um, when you look back over the last, let's call it 30 years or so, uh, 25, 30 years, um, there's, there's the, the presence, there, there's always been a, a presence of, of transaction activity and, and consolidation that's been occurring. Um, I tend to look back and you can kind of, when you, when you look back and, um, you know, think about some of the different time frames here, uh, I believe you can um, you can extract some reoccurring themes that really were related to some specific eras or periods um, of consolidation that happened during this time, and I just call those waves of consolidation, uh, where these where these uh, reoccurring themes or, or a certain era or period in that wave was was characterized by um, some some key components or, or common themes, um, and. You know, whether you go back to the early 90s and the, the onset and emergence of, and, and even you could say the late 80s and before, um, but the, the emergence of the, the for-profit health system model, um, whether you're talking about you know, the, the rise of, of systems like HCA and everything that has spawned from that sense or, or other um, for-profit systems that have emerged um, similarly, um, or other kind of corporate-backed for-profit um, systems that uh, were have been involved in, in all aspects of healthcare delivery, whether it's uh, ASC management companies or outpatient uh, companies, things like that. Um, you know, that really led into what I call the first wave of hospital physician deals um, in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s, uh, where you're seeing where you were seeing a lot of the uh, hospitals and physicians doing deals, hospitals buying out practices employing physicians, um, and, and you saw other kind of uh, organizations like the, uh, the physician management organizations and, and other things similar to that uh, that emerged as a part of that. Um, fast forward, you know, not too long after that when many of those deals just for a variety of reasons, and we're not going to dive into them here, but many of you lived through this, I'm sure, and, and can, can recall um, a lot of those deals did not end up working or, or pr proved to be productive. Uh, so a lot of them were unwound, and you saw a lot of divestitures and spinoffs, and, and uh, that in and of itself was a form of consolidation uh, and, or you know, at least a characterization of it. And, and one of the things there was you saw a, a lot of a mentality of back to basics, whether you're it was a physician back to getting back being their own boss in a practice setting, whether it was with a group or individual, and then on the hospital side, focusing on what, what they knew and felt like they did best, which was uh, running hospitals. Um, latter half of the 2000s, the financial crisis hit, credit crunch. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the pool and universe of buyers really decreased, um, and, and uh, the, particularly the access to credit. Um, and and the, the volatility in the, the credit markets and the bond markets um, affected everybody. And, and, you know, that really affected on down to even the, the community-owned health system because there are a lot of hospital authorities during this time that, you know, were struggling with bond ratings and, and other credit-related issues that uh, just had not been planned for or been anticipated. As a, as a part of this overall kind of evolution, and so um, th that really emerged uh, out of that the uh, the increase in, in in going after distressed assets or similar situations where there were value opportunities, meaning buy cheap and try to build and grow or turn it around or you know turn it around and grow it and sell it. Uh, those types of things, and then um, the the second wave, what I call the second wave of, of hospital physician deals, really started to come online late 2000s, early 2010s, where uh, the physician the hospital physician alignment returned, but uh, definitely with a, a different uh, focus or mindset. I believe um, it, it certainly happened slower, and it's continuing to happen to, even today, obviously. Um, but you know there was. There was a lot of hesitation on both sides, and so I think it was a little bit more of uh, dipping kind of the toe in the water as opposed to just diving in as it had been done in a lot of cases previously. 
So we saw physician employment come back, but this also segued into other forms, other alignment models, um, whether it's the professional services agreement or things like that, or other uh, alignment models that uh, we've talked about before. Um, and this is also when the uh, really the onset of, of healthcare reform came in in the late 2010s and 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 uh, early uh, 2015. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Early 2010s, where um, up to 2015, where really the the, uh, the PPACA um, Accountable Care Act started to take shape and and be implemented, and we've seen even up to today where we're at now, um, where really a lot of the consolidation is being driven by healthcare reform. Um, the focus is is being shifted, and you'll hear me and anybody at Coker that you talk to, you'll probably hear us use this term or refer to this, uh, this, this shift of volume to value. And that really is driving a characterization of what's driving the healthcare uh, delivery model today. And there's, there's a lot there in that. And I know we've, we've done a lot of uh, uh, webinars and speaking on that specific subject and we'll continue to do so. We won't dive into that, what that really means today, other than to say the focus now is on value um, and, and not just simply strength in numbers, as it were, or maybe as it was uh, five, eight years ago. Um, and, and, and then also, I think what we're calling transactions has evolved. Um, as we we're, we're talking about more than, again, just traditional M&A, uh, merger and acquisition, but now really anything's on the board, anything and everything, and, and a lot of systems and, and provider organizations have, have been very crafty and, and ambitious and, and, um, and, 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 you know, have had a lot of success and, and really kind of um, thinking out of the box as it relates to doing deals. So it's joint ventures, other affiliation models, alignment structures, um, as well as the traditional M&A. Regardless of what's driving consolidation today, um, we, I, I get some, there's, there's absolutely reoccurring themes in terms of the questions that we're getting from uh, clients uh, that we're hearing uh, come out of, you know, the conferences and, and panels we attend, um, talking to others in the industry. Uh, and, you know, a lot of them, particularly as a result to transactions, um, can be summarized in, in a couple of three points here. Uh, how do organizations ensure that the ultimate result from a transaction strategy is value creation? Again, we'll talk about defining what value means for, for your organization uh, shortly. Um, how can organizations achieve value over an extended period of time from their transaction strategies? So it's it got to be more, and again, we'll dive into this uh, more in a minute, but uh, it really does have to go beyond uh, Getting a deal done, or doing a deal, and and that's that's our that's our growth strategy. Uh, there really it has to have more behind that, and has to be a part of a bigger uh, picture or paradigm. Uh, and then, you know, how can we as leaders within healthcare organizations, whether it's a hospital or a system or a, a practice, uh, or if you're a physician in leadership positions? Um, regardless of what it is you're trying to do, ultimately, um, you know, how can we uh, go about uh, doing deals to achieve that true long-term value? Um, so as, as we're thinking about this, uh, let's talk about, as I, as I alluded to before, I think we do have to look at what, what are some of the trends that are taking place. And we looked about kind of the, at the history already and how we got to where we are today maybe in terms of the different waves of consolidation. But some of the key trends, uh, population health, there, there are a lot of different terms. I, I think the term population health probably now is, is almost outdated. Um, now there's all kinds of different terms that we're referring to what, what ultimately we mean when we talk about things like population health. Again, it goes back to me using that term volume to value. I think that ultimately characterizes the, from a very high level, the shift we're talking about. Um, but all of this is playing a key role in driving hospital consolidation and driving hospital physician alignment and consolidation at that level. Um, you know, the, the focus is more on, um, or there's much more of a focus on uh, lowering costs and improving quality. Uh, you're going to hear those 
those are going to be reoccurring themes that you hear and talking about, whether you're talking about transactions or you know whatever your your growth and and value strategy is long term for your organization. Those are going to be key factors and key components of that. Um, when you think about smaller hospitals, and this definitely applies to uh, groups as well, physician groups of all sizes, and 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 other kind of allied healthcare services. Um, dealing within, tr trying to grasp what this means, and and thinking about what do we do to fit in with this this uh, this new paradigm. Um, it, it can be it can be daunting. It can be overwhelming. Um, it can be frustrating. Uh, and, and that you know it's 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 only um, going to become more and more difficult to to get the value you want and need out of your organization as we go forward. And and then when you think about hospital and, and physician consolidation, um, your hospitals doing deals with specialty groups is nothing new. That's been going on for years. Uh, the dynamic there continues to evolve between those those types of, of groups. Um, but the, what we've seen in terms of health care reform and, and the Accountable Care Act um, has definitely fueled that even more. And so we're, at, we're seeing new players come into this, this whole landscape. Um, it's funny, I was thinking about this. I read an article, I think Modern Healthcare or, or Becker's recently, and uh, it was about the, the significant increase in the last year of, um, of primary care entities, uh, primary care focused uh, healthcare services entities that um, are now getting a, an influx of an interest in uh, ca investment capital in in these these groups from private equity. Uh, these are you know, private uh, financial investment firms that are investing in primary care entities, uh, and and you know what that means. That, that, that can kind of take shape in a, in a number of different ways when you get down into the details of it. But but I, 10 years ago, I did not expect that statistic to come out that, uh, you know, the, that private equity firms are, um, are focusing more and more and doing a significant number of more deals in uh, primary care. Uh, I think that's very indicative of what we're seeing as a result of of um, the the equity capital investment that's coming in, it's also done a lot in terms of the valuation uh, fluctuations that we're seeing. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, healthcare reform has also uh, implemented or or inserted this this theme or this this new consideration, this new kind of variable as it relates to risk management, uh, risk based contracting, um, as you know. A, a key theme as it relates to new payment reimbursement models. The the uh, the the reimbursement paradigm is changing, and we're at the very early um, onset of that evolution. Um, we have things like macro and MIPS legislation that, that, that will kick off um, uh, January of 2017. Um, so we're already seeing, you know, from the Medicare side, from the government side, um, you know, the, the shift towards it is part of that volume to value, but particularly looking at risk-based contracts, risk-based reimbursement models, alternative payment models, and things like bundled payments, and that factors in other, you know, quality measurements and benchmarks, um, and, and that also, you know, if you're, if you're talking about that, then you're, your reporting and analytics and and tech, uh, technological infrastructure and systems have to be um, adequate and and so you know similar to what I I think this is just my opinion similar to what we saw with meaningful use a number of years ago uh, there was a there was a rush to kind of comply but it wasn't long after meaningful use came into effect that that became literally the the bare bones basic. Uh, Kind of floor standard for um, reporting as related to electronic medical records and and practice management, um, and and I think the same is going to be as it relates to macro and MIPS and, and other similar programs they're already talking about. So it's definitely changing the reimbursement paradigm, and um, and this is about risk, risk management, and and ultimately risk sharing. So when you think about 
smaller organizations or or just any organization of any size um, that you know is thinking about the the uh, sometimes overwhelming thought of bearing the risk involved in, in, in models like this or or models that you know will most likely come as this evolves um, that's where you know consolidation becomes more and more relevant and more and more applicable because uh, you know there is is benefit their strength in numbers play there as it relates to sharing risk and being able to shed some of the risk off off the shoulders of a single organization, particularly one that that may already you know have enough it's dealing with as it is, um, and and so you know whether they're larger organizations or it's just certain organizations within certain market dynamics and and uh, you know wherever whatever your positioning is, um, you know there there are going to be some that have uh, more stability, more strength that will allow. Them to capitalize in in a system uh, that's shifting more to risk-based models and and other alternative payment models, um, whereas others need are going to need to lean on those organizations um, in order to navigate that process more effectively and more successfully. And so, you know, that's um, that's going to continue to fuel consolidation. It already is, but I think it's only become more so as we really start to move into this this. This next evolution, and um, and then you know now the last few years we know that there's been a lot of alignment, a lot of affiliations, a lot of consolidation. Uh, what we're many of our clients are confronted with now is now we actually have to do something with it. Um, so uh, not just alignment, but true integration, and that's where you get into clinical integration. And so it's you know the the evolution of the clinically integrated network. And and other similar models is again we're we're in the early stages of of those um, models emerging and evolving. And we're only going to see more of that now. Um, I, I'm very hesitant when we have these discussions to to talk about valuations and trends in valuations and and transaction uh, data points. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, uh, but basically. Uh, you know, the, the valuation the valuation discussion is is too complex when it relates to healthcare services companies. Uh, it's just too complex in order to to the point that you could boil it down to even a, a, an hour long discussion. Um, and and I actually believe it's it's truly unique to every organization. So um, you know, when we're talking about uh, uh, data points and and multiples and and uh, and and you know EBITDA trends things like that. Uh, I think we got to be very careful. Um, and and you know my big disclaimer here is please do not look at any data and, and look at this and and say okay this is something that I'm going to go and, and apply this to my my organization or, or the situation we're in right now or go and try to to use this as a as a basis for um, you know, negotiating evaluation and trying to do a deal. Um, it just doesn't work like that, and and this is something where you know probably going to have a, a lot of questions and and you know some follow up here, and, and I would rather be able to have those discussions um, and and have a little bit more productive discussion by you know uh, understanding a little bit more uh, the, the the unique context of of each case. So with that disclaimer being said, I think it is important to look at, and if we're talking about trends, we do have to kind of look at some of the key data points. And, and I thought, you know, it's interesting looking at the drivers of consolidation. We already know lower costs and increasing efficiency is going to be key, particularly in the context of healthcare reform um, and, and the drivers we've already talked about. Um, and so when, you, when you're talking about how to achieve value, uh, there, there's a, a uh, Survey that was that was released, uh, I believe, is published 2015. So the data is a little dated. Uh, so bear with me. But uh, I thought it was very telling, particularly the top two points here from this Modern Healthcare um, article. But uh, about half of of the respondents, and these are all healthcare provider organizations, hospitals, physician groups, etc., um, said that the quality of care will improve as a result 
of M&A activity, and just over half uh, said the cost of care will decrease as a result of it. And so I think this is an interesting kind of uh, chicken or the egg conversation. Um, is, is consolidation and the transaction activity, um, is that truly driving down uh, or increasing quality and driving down costs? Or, or maybe it's the other way around, where um, as a result of consolidation, um, these things are happening. And I think it's probably a little bit of both, honestly, from, from my experience. Um, but I think that the thing this really says about the marketplace and, and all of the data points, I believe, lend to this, is that it's a very competitive market space, marketplace. Um, doing deals, achieving value is, is harder because of competition, and and it's not a bad thing. That isn't to say that this is the dog eat dog market out there right now, or it's it's cutthroat or anything like that. It's not competition in a bad way. It's I genuinely believe right now we're seeing the the competitive dynamics um, be a positive thing. Now that that can always change, and and there you know differences depending on you know different markets, different uh, categories of uh, segments of the marketplace, but. Um, you know, that may not be everybody's experience or perspective, uh, but I think that's kind of where we're at now. Um, we know that the volume of, of deals has increased, um, so more there's more consolidation consistently. Um, and, you know, and, and two years ago it increased 18%, uh, the volume of, of, of M&A. Um, but this is also, um, uh, you know, in line with uh, the the increase in valuations. And so M&A value has also grown since 2014, and, and um, the concentration really, and this isn't anything too surprising, but I think it's relevant, uh, since the, the last two and a half years or so, um, about 65% involves not-for-profits, whereas 35% is for-profit. And, and I think, honestly, my, my take on that is probably a little bit more weighted towards the not-for-profits because now we're seeing a lot more of, of uh, alignment strategies, joint ventures, affiliations, different models coming on between for-profits and not-for-profits. So really the lines are, are uh, starting to cross and, and I, I think that's only increasing, that's as a result of the competition or the competitive landscape. It's also, uh, you know, at the same time increasing the, the competitive nature as well. Um, and and it, as always, valuations, when you talk about entities like this, it's going to they're going to vary, and it's going to be based depend on uh, the size and scale of the deal, the types of organizations. Um, it, obviously, it, it's a different whole different dynamic when you're talking about a hospital uh, purchasing an equity stake in a single specialty ASC um, versus doing an employment deal and a practice buyout or a professional services agreement arrangement, those types of arrangements, um, versus, uh, you know, two hospitals, two acute care centers coming together. So um, they really can't generalize this effectively. Um, but there, there are some, some, some multiples there. Uh, we tend to look at valuations um, as, uh, on a basis of enterprise value to revenue, enterprise value to EBITDA, EBITDA, which is your, your earnings for a not-for-profit system that's EBITDA without the T. Um, but basically this is um, you know, the, the value of a deal compared to the revenue or compared to the, the earnings of the, the entities involved. And so, um, you know, I, I think these are, these are about as general as you can get. Um, and, and again, these aren't the types of numbers that you're going to go and take to, uh, you know, to your negotiations and use as a basis. And, and I think it is dangerous to, to take any sort of report or data that's released and, and try to apply it to your individual situation without some, some a healthy dose of context there. So um, it is relevant. Talking about the valuation of a, of a deal is, is absolutely relevant, um, but it's a relatively small portion of the overall picture. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, some of the challenges, again, this is coming from some, some surveys that have been done. I, I thought, you know, Deloitte did a survey that was released last year, again, a little bit dated, but I, I think it's still telling, um, where talking about the, the key factors um, for engaging in, in M&A deals and then talking about some of the greatest challenges in, in getting the deals done. Now, the, the most interesting thing here on the bottom graph um, the second and third items from the right, 
uh, realizing expected synergies and integrating operations and workforce. Those two things, which 20 to 30 percent uh, of people said those were those were key challenges. Um, th those to me have nothing to do, or at least not not solely to do with getting a deal done or doing a deal at all. Um, those are those are things. Those translate to me into how do we make a deal pay off for us for our organization, fit in our strategy, and achieve our value targets long term. And and that's really what we're talking about today. And and rarely does that come back to what you paid for an asset, what you paid at close of a deal, um, the the tr the sole financial economic consideration paid in a transaction. It, it, typically, that's uh, only a fraction of the overall kind of landscape or picture that, that you have to think about when you're thinking about long-term long value creation and, and you know, achieving that through a transaction. And you know, some of the challenges here that we've listed, this is feedback from, from clients, feedback from AI you know, regularly kind of survey our clients and, and you know, try to stay on top of some of the things they're thinking about, um, some things they're facing, and, and you know, no major surprise here, but a lot of this boils down to uh, planning on the front end, um, identifying the value targets so you kind of know what your, your benchmark is, what your thresholds are, and what you're ultimately going after, um, getting the right expertise and, and people and leadership on board, um, to, to make that possible and to, to go and effectuate that as a reality. And, and then, um, you know, other more specific things as it relates to deals, uh, the, you know, a proper evaluation of, of a deal both pre- and post-transaction. You know, usually we think about evaluating a deal or due diligence. Um, it's something that kind of you do it, you sign off, and you move forward with the deal. But really, uh, it's, a, it's a much more in-depth discussion than that. Um, and, and, and when you're looking at integration after the deal, uh, you know, having the, the ongoing uh, programs in place and the leadership there that allows you to go and do that. So we'll, we'll move on here, but uh, happy to come back to some of that if, if uh, anybody has any questions. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so let's talk about defining value and how you look at, at value. Since we just kind of talked about valuations, and I gave my disclaimer, um, and I, I made the comment about the fact that when you're looking at the, the financial terms or the economic consideration of a deal involving a healthcare services entity, um, the, the price is only a fraction of the overall picture. Uh, the overall puzzle, if you will, and, um, and and I believe it's a relatively small part. Now, it's not insignificant, don't get me wrong, but I, I don't believe when we're talking about achieving value from transactions that we can just restrict it to talking about the, the price of a deal alone. Um, one of the things, and, and again, I already alluded to this a little bit, but when you're talking about the financial drivers and talking about valuations, uh, they're, they're unique, and the, the financial consideration is, is always going to be limited in terms of its range and how flexible anyone can be, regardless of what organization, who you're talking to, uh, and the different parties involved. There's only so much room, only so much range you can have on determining the price of a, value, of, of a, of a transaction involving th these types of entities. And, and that's because we won't get into all the, the technical details on this, but there's you know, fair market value considerations, there's um, antitrust, there's stark provisions, there's position compensation components, there's commercial reasonableness, um, all kinds of legal and regulatory uh, standards, regulations, um, requirements that, that you ultimately have to comply with. So rarely, bottom line, are you going to be negotiating a deal involving uh, any type of healthcare services entity that the, the impetus of the discussion is on um, the price. Uh, rarely are you going to sit there and, and, and talk about, well, you gave us a uh, four, and four and a quarter EBITDA multiple. We think we're more like five and three quarters um, EBITDA multiple because um, it just, you know, it, there, there's too much behind that and there's too much kind of governing, governing that process to have 
um, such significant range. And so if you're having that discussion, you know, I, I'd urge you to kind of take a step back maybe and think about are we focused on the right things? Are we talking about the right uh, priorities here? And, and think about really what you're trying to do and, and what the constraints are, what the parameters are, and, and work within those confines and, and not try to um, do something where you're gonna, everybody's going to end up frustrated, kind of feeling like they're running into a brick wall at every turn. And so um, I, I think in this segment of the market, you're talking about value drivers that are often tied um, to less you know, the financial consideration, valuation, economic factors. Um, it's less about the EBITDA multiples and the, and the other data points that we hear a lot about, um, and really more what we call non-economic or qualitative factors. And, and the truth about this is this is hard because we can at least get a, wrap our heads around and do analysis around numbers and the quantitative aspect of things. And, and you know, Coker can come in and give you real nice, extensive, uh, valuation models and 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 we can do all kinds of data mining exercises for you and 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 those things are necessary to do from a compliance standpoint and and due diligence standpoint but at the end of the day um, the the true value behind deals right now is is again goes much further than what's the price or uh, what's the financial, what are the financial terms that are going into this definitive agreement for this particular transaction. And it's really about more, why are we doing this and what are we ultimately trying to achieve and how do we achieve that together. Um, and, and those things can be a lot more challenging, a lot harder to, to quantify or put, uh, or to put into terms that, that we can digest and translate more broadly. Um, Another assumption here is that a, a lot of organizations will, will go into deals and 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 assume that the, whatever the value drivers are, assume that they're clear or assume that they've been identified, assume that well someone's looked at this and validates this and and it makes sense, so therefore it's going to work. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I think we can't move forward going on an assumption that well it seems to make sense and therefore. Um, let's do it, and uh, you know, just because you know, in the past, one good plus one good equaled one great. Um, it, just because that may have worked, doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. Doesn't mean it's going to work for your individual case. Um, and and so, really, you got to look deeper into that. And there's there's a lot more to answering that question. Um, this is just an excerpt from uh, a um, white paper that that we have. Coming out, um, we actually, I meant to say that at the beginning, but we have a white paper on this subject that also has, it dives in a little bit deeper and more has more discussion around a lot of these topics, a lot of these, these talking points in this presentation. So um, I, I'm sure you all will receive that, but be looking for that, and, and hopefully that, that can also help in, in terms of answering some questions or, or where you're thinking. But basically this says what, what, what I just said, and that um, you know, in the past a lot of deals just seemed to make sense, and a lot of deals, whether it was just dumb luck or things the right place, right time, or you know, the market dynamics were such that um, even without extensive planning, uh, doing the deal really did just kind of make sense and it ended up working. Um, now, because of the competitive dynamics, because of the, the evolving paradigm and things like reimbursement models and payment models and, and, and other uh, things, whether it's related to healthcare reform or the Accountable Care Act or population health, volume to value, all those things that's driving consolidation and consolidation is changing as a result of those things ultimately points us into a direction of uh, that, that to conclude that value is, is much more challenging um, now and it's, it value, achieving value is much more elusive than it ever has been in the past. Um, and, and even if you, you know, have done your planning and, and have a, a good kind of strategic outlook and, and targets what you're going after in terms of what value means for you and your organization. Um, nowadays, just, just defining the value target, whether it's for a deal or in general, um, you know, that can be challenging enough, but that's only, again, one step in an overall process. So um, we're not just talking about valuing assets or the, the economic terms of a deal here. Um, but so, and I think we got to look, okay, so what's missing? How do we get from 
you know, looking at a specific transaction um, to, you know, some sort of trajectory uh, over time that ultimately gets us to where we're trying to go and, and creating value for our organization. Uh, again, whatever that means for you. So what's missing uh, in between setting these targets and actually seeing them through to reality? Is it the lack of plan? Uh, maybe unrealistic or unclear expectations? Uh, maybe expectations that are not effectively communicated across an organization? Um, maybe the timing isn't right? Are there external market variables there going on in your respective market that that um, you know is influenced these expectations one way or another, and, and I think, you know, between those things and, and I'm sure a lot of other kind of variables, um, the answer is yes. All these are really reasons why, um, you know, uh, delivering long-term value is, is more and more of a challenge, and, and it's probably more than anything, it's a combination of, of these things and other things that ultimately make this more challenging. Um, how, how do we limit the risk of failure? And, and, and avoid missing a deal's value targets or, or avoid missing our value targets through a particular transaction or through a deal strategy. Um, and and cause, cause this really does go beyond looking at a specific deal, but this really is about using transactions as an overall arching, overarching strategy working towards um, value creation. And, um, you know, here I think um, you know, I, I think there, there's so much more to answering this question today than what we have time for. Um, but yeah, first, start by looking towards the concept of identifying what those value targets even are. Um, you have to kind of understand what value means for you. Um, if you're if you're able to do that, excuse me, if you're not able to do that, then I, I think probably the best recommendation I have for you is take a step back and. And, and make sure this and the other fundamental pieces are clearly addressed and defined and you kind of know everybody's on the same page uh, in terms of where you're ultimately trying to get. Um, otherwise, you know, I don't think you can expect a, a deal, particularly in this competitive marketplace, um, just, you know, which, which is, entails significant investment, investment of, of capital, investment of resources, investment of time, people, et cetera, all those things that have significant impacts on the organization as a whole, and you all understand how that works. Um, and, you know, you just can't expect those to deliver the value without some of these things being in place. And so I, I think you have to be able to articulate these you know, fundamental points. It has to be translatable across an organization, throughout you know, an organization's leadership team, and uh, and and everybody kind of has to have clarity on on why you're doing this, where you're ultimately trying to 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 get, and um, and then you can start thinking about the how, if you will. Um, and and if you know you have identified these value targets, and you feel like you got a pretty clear picture of where you're ultimately trying to go. Um, then, then by all means, let's let's do it. Let's move forward. But the emphasis here is move forward with a plan. And and you know, so often, kind of say, yeah, we know what we're trying to do. We know where we're trying to get. We have our strategy outlined. So let's dive in. And then we kind of find ourselves scrambling and either doing, trying to do everything, uh, and and getting into kind of a mile wide, inch deep scenario. Or, or we're trying to do so much that we're not really doing anything at all, or we're doing everything, and that includes bad stuff as well. And so I think that, you know, there's, there's again, we're talking about the steps to this process to making sure it's done right, and a lot of that entails kind of backing up and making sure that the fundamental, the foundational pieces are there. Um, and so then we come to the planning process, and a lot of this, uh, what we're talking about today, really does come back to planning. Um, whether it's developing the strategy or outlining the, the plan, the map, the roadmap to implementing that strategy, wherever you are in that, um, you know, this, that's really what we're talking about is some of the most critical pieces to making sure a deal really does pay off in the long run. Um, so, you know, having a plan or, or going through the planning process seems pretty obvious. All you hospital folks out there um, probably used to dealing with planning departments and strategic planning uh, teams and and all that. A lot of that though ends up, you know, it's stuff. The stuff they end up working on is is 
you know, there's a lot of um, more kind of mechanics, I would say, whether it's, uh, you know, site expansion and facility planning and real estate and those types of things. Um, or it's really, really big picture is in you know, our strategic plan is to go after these top specialties and to really increase our, our market share in, in, within these particular demographics or something like that. But I, I think a lot of times what we miss is connecting the dots to, okay, well, how do you go and take something like that and putting it into action in a, in a way that uh, not only makes sense for your organization and your respective market, but, you know, is going to result in the greatest value and the greatest returns, you know, the, you know really achieving that level of optimization um, and while, you know, diminishing or, or reducing risk at the same time. So it seems obvious, but this really is one of the pieces, particularly when you're talking about going through the deal process, doing a transaction, again, it can be any size, any scale, involving any type of healthcare uh, entity here that we're talking about, um, particularly when we're talking about a transaction, this planning piece is one that just kind of, it, it may not be totally ignored, um, but it's, it's, often, I would say, overlooked in a way that, you know, you, it's kind of there, but the emphasis, there's not a great deal of emphasis on that. So uh, planning is critical. Um, we, we like to refer to this as developing a roadmap. And, and I like this term, the reason I've liked this term roadmap over the years is because you're talking about something that um, is a little bit more tangible. You know, obviously, dealing with a map, um, I, I, can, I, I can have a, a uh, an old atlas, you know, book um, that will help me kind of get uh, maybe, you know, on from where I need to go in terms of the highways and everything. But, you know, if I'm taking back roads and trying to get to a specific address, then obviously I'm going to go to that, that app on my phone, that navigation app that really takes me from point A to point B. And, and also offers me the, you know, do you want the fastest route, the most direct route, or, you know, do you need to avoid traffic up ahead or police radars and all those accidents and those types of things, um, it, you know, help me navigate that and make it uh, most as efficient as possible. And, and so, you know, really the roadmap helps navigate from being, you know, two separate organization through how many ever X years down the road to, um, you know, clear value being achieved together, uh, as, you know, from, from this transaction as a result of this deal. Um, where where the the organizations that were once separate are now together, and they can now they're working together to continue building on that value model as one uh, going forward into the future. And uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot kind of embedded in that statement that um, that's easy to overlook there. So um, you know I don't want that to be missed. Um, and and you know any any um, strategic plan or big picture idea or vision. Um, obviously, there's going to be a lot of, of smaller pieces that ultimately, uh, you know, smaller pieces of, of the overall uh, map or, or trajectory um, that you have to consider, and these are key segments of the overall process. So not only do you have to find, you know, it, it, there's part of it is finding the deal and particularly finding the right deal, um, and, uh, and then you got to do the deal and do the deal most effectively, most efficiently as, as you possibly can. And then you think about, okay, going forward as one, um, integration in a way that, uh, you know, allows you to become one body working towards collective target or targets. And, um, and th there's just so much there that's overlooked. This isn't just integrating IT systems. It's not integrating HR and, and, uh, and things like that, but truly, um, you know, long-term integration done in a way that um, doesn't distract, that doesn't impede, and, and certainly doesn't uh, diminish things, uh, the quality of service, the quality of, of care, and things like that. Um, so, you know, all these pieces are critical, and, and it's essential that they're, they're, they're done in a way, they're managed in a way that allows to achieve this long-term value um, in the most streamlined, seamless manner across throughout this entire process. So regardless of where you are maybe in a deal uh, transaction scenario today, um, you, can, you can do this and cover all these different points from planning to uh, planning where this fits in our overall strategy and how, what this is, you know, 
ultimately supposed to look like in terms of delivering value to going through the deal itself, getting the deal done, and, and planning for integration, and then integrating after the fact. And so really this, this roadmap, I, I like to look at it as kind of the, the treasure map, right? It's trying to get you out. I like this statement here at the bottom of this slide because it's, it's, it's very um, kind of like a, uh, reality series of uh, you know uh, survivor or something like that, but you know the, the roadmap really is is your guide to a, a, an elusive, well-guarded treasure, and and to eventually arrive at that final X where the treasure is marking the spot. Um, you'll have to complete an individual series of tasks or challenges along the way. And only when you reach the top of one hill, we ultimately be able to proceed to the next mountain ahead. And, and that's ultimately what it is, right? You never really get to that, that, uh, that buried treasure in, in the way that we like to think about it. But it truly is kind of an ongoing evolution. It's an ongoing process. Um, a lot of the value comes from just working to ultimately get there, too. So I think that's a key part. So let's talk about um, some of the key components of, of transactions. And I'll try to move through some of this stuff quickly because we've only got about 10 more minutes. Um, and I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. Uh, this is somewhere in area where we get into a little bit more of the, the transaction mechanics or some of the key things to look for in the transaction. So you may have specific questions here or you'll be able to look at the slides when you, when you get them after, after the presentation. And, and you may want to dive in to some of this stuff a little bit more specifically or in depth and happy to do that again if you want to reach out to me. Uh, but um, obviously we talked about the importance of, of strategy and planning, driving, using transactions as a component of an overarching strategy uh, for growth and, and value creation for, for reaching those value targets. Um, it, you know, it, now more than ever, uh, value is, is rarely achieved by just doing a deal or simply getting the deal done. Um, it, it does have to fall within kind of this big picture, um, you know, perspective. And, and if that's the case, then there has to be a good big picture that, that exists in the first place. To ha you got to have a target to ultimately shoot for. Um, so that involves setting your targets and then forming your roadmap, as we talked about. Um, you got to have all the, the key stakeholders and, and, and key parties on board um, internally and externally. Uh, particularly when we're talking about a transaction, you got to think about you, you, there's more, there are more people, more parties at play here than just your organization and even just the, uh, the organization you're looking at, at buying or, or aligning with or affiliating with. Um, due diligence is, is a key part of this, and, and I say comprehensive due diligence here because it emphasis on comprehensive, and, and there are kind of degrees or, or phases of due diligence, and we'll talk about that, have more information on that shortly. Um, and, and it, you know, it really does have to be more than just kind of confirming a, an asset value or a, 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 a purchase price or anything like that. It has to be more than simply taking a peek under the hood, if, if you will. Um, again, managing the deal as a process and strategically addressing all pieces in that process. Uh, and, and when you're thinking about this, you, you think about transaction or doing a deal, it truly is um, an investment, but it's more than just, again, that, that uh, purchase price or more than just that financial consideration and the economic terms. Uh, it's more than just an asset being acquired. There's a lot more at stake here. And so when you're thinking about what's it going to cost, what's the full-on investment going to be in terms of doing this, not only doing the deal, but, but making the deal pay off, uh, that's different. And you've got you to think about more than just those, those limited factors. And, and you know, part of that is, is the role in, of advisors and, and the value of using advisors and where you need them, where you don't. Um, key phases. I, we break down the phases of a transaction, or I do, uh, into these kind of general broad categories. Obviously, these don't apply to every deal scenario. They're not. This doesn't capture every different variable on on every transaction. But but as a in general, um, as a general statement, I, I think these phases truly do come into play in any sort of transaction that you're talking about. Whether you're talking about a billion dollar merger of two hospital systems or a hospital system aligning through an employment agreement and a practice purchase with a, a medical practice, physician practice, or you're talking about a, a purchasing an equity stake in a, in a surgery center or doing some sort of professional services agreement with a, 
a uh, specialty group um, with a system or with a series of outpatient centers um, where you're going to buy and own portions of those. Uh, whatever the case may be, whatever the size, the scale, and uh, whatever the different characteristics are of a transaction, these generally apply to some degree, and they're varying. And and this is very general. A lot of information I realize on on this particular slide. Um, so I, I realize it's going to take kind of more to digest this, but this still, even with all the information here, is very generalized. Um, but when you think about these these key phases. Um, really, it starts with strategy and planning, and, and strategy and planning doesn't have to be something that takes one to three months. It doesn't have to be something that takes three weeks. Um, it may be, it may be, you may be in the midst of a of a deal already, um, but you can always kind of go back and make sure uh, it doesn't have to be overly exhaustive to um, go back and ensure that you know what you're doing does fit within the plan, and if you know the plan. If there's a gap in that plan, uh, you, know, you can kind of reevaluate at that time and kind of figure out and ensure that that it fits. And uh, you know, if you're on the buy side, you may then be going out to market and identifying deals, or you know, kind of the the targets you have and who you want to go after, what entities you, you're trying to ultimately go after. And so, there's a process parts of that process alone that you know it can take time, just because you may be dealing with all kinds of different parties and. And uh, and you know just communicate the, the communications process can can take some time there, but um, really when you get further into the to an actual deal is where you get into phase two and you're talking more about okay we have parties at the table we're talking about due diligence we're talking about agreements we're talking about terms and provisions financial economic terms non economic terms what other commitments are going to be involved in this deal and that's what we call kind of confirmatory due diligence um, and and this really is kind of validating that okay we you know know we have enough information to be able to at least validate that um, the, the the what we're talking about in terms of the the purchase price and the financial considerations makes reasonable sense or within it we're in a workable range here um, the other commitments that are on the table are things we think we can work with and you know we're ready to move forward and try to move forward in under an exclusive arrangement so we can we can all have time to breathe talk to each other and and allow our people and our advisors to really go and, and do the deal in the most efficient most effective way so that ultimately if and when this deal uh, it, it happens and it's and, and it's closed and finalized um, we'll be ready to hit the ground running, and uh, that'll be better for everybody involved. Otherwise, if if you don't have that, then you may want to think about should we be doing this deal in the first place. So all these these steps are critical, um, you know, kind of foundational components as you move along to each each subsequent step. Um, what's unique in in the healthcare world is just because you may come together as two organizations and agree on terms and price and and all those things, you still have to get to whatever extent involved in your individual situation, um, some sort of regulatory legal approval out there. If it's certain size deal involving hospitals, particularly not-for-profit hospitals, you may need to get uh, approvals from the state's attorney general's office and the Federal Trade Commission and other uh, potential you know government bodies. Um, and so everything has to be done and, and submitted and filed leading up to that. For smaller deals, uh, you, you you know may not be as as uh, overwhelming or as burdensome, but um, there's still a lot of regulatory compliance compliance excuse me steps that have to be uh, taken care of along the way. So you got to get to an agreement point, then you get into the regulatory filing phase, and that's really when you start thinking about integration and start planning, not just hey, these are the things we found in due diligence and hey, we're going to have to deal with when we, when we ultimately close this thing, but truly looking at it from a standpoint of, okay, these are the things we, we know we need to deal with. Let's go ahead and start developing the game plan to, to making sure we jump right in day one. We can do this as smooth as possible and, um, and ultimately reach those value targets, a greater chance of reaching those value targets and ideally maybe in, in less time, shorter period of time, 
um, you know, or, or do it with, uh, you know, with less investment, less cost, or whatever the case may be. So, um, you know, those those are very general. Again, happy to talk to you guys about, you know, how some of the, the different specifics and dive into some of these specific areas and what the mechanics look like and, and when you get into these stages. But, um, you know, very, from a very general perspective, uh, that's, uh, that's definitely some of, the, some of the characteristics you can look for. So um, with that, um, I, uh, that's, that's all I have, you guys. Um, I hope you, um, you feel free to, again, reach out to me with any questions. Um, reach out uh, if you want to have a call and, and dive into any specific subject matter or material or data points a little bit further. Um, if you just want to pick my brain about something, happy to do that. Um, and, um, and I don't have, um, well, uh, let me just make sure. No, I don't have any specific questions um, other than there was one, I believe, that came in. Um, there was a question that goes back to, and I'll go back a couple slides here about the role and, and at that last point, the role and value of advisors. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about um, you know, why you need to go out and hire people to help you with transactions, people like myself or, or firms like Coker. Um, I, I can, you know, that's a discussion I often have with clients or prospective clients, and so happy to kind of explain, um, you know, what, what the different things, what the different pieces can look like uh, in terms of how um, we can help you all achieve whatever this value target is through a deal strategy. Or, or whatever it may be. Um, the, the biggest thing I'll say there is, um, you know, whoever you get to help you, whatever, whether it's a legal uh, counsel, whether it's financial advisors, whether it's management consultants or, or a combination or, 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 or something else, um, you know, their, their value should, should be pretty compelling. It should be pretty clear, pretty obvious in terms of, uh, ultimately, achieving those value targets um, more effectively, quicker, uh, you know, uh, less costs. Um, it, you know, I, I think I, I would encourage anyone to think about the uh, the need and the use of of good quality advisors and consultants and counsel um, as a part of that overall investment. So back to the previous point there, the second to last point, um, you know, I think that that should be a part of the budget. That should be a part of the investment you're making because at the end of the day, it's going to pay off. And, you know, you're, all the components of that investment need to, um, you know, be able to pay off down the road. And so I, I believe that, that those two have to connect, and uh, and if they don't, then you know you you, you either you may not need that that outside help, or or you know you may need something different. So um, again, that's kind of my explanation of that, and uh, I don't want this to be a uh, a sales or pitch or or you know marketing anything like that. Um, but happy to kind of dive into that a little bit further if anybody. Uh, has any additional questions? So, um, with that, I will uh, I will end the presentation. Again, thank you very much. And uh, again, please feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you, Mark, for that presentation. Um, like you said, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to him directly. Again, we would appreciate your feedback on this presentation through the survey as you exit the webinar. And the slides to this presentation will be emailed to you. Thank you for joining us today.